Okay, so to continue where we left off, let's do some uh, revision questions together. Recap, what does proximate analysis include? All right, Dan? Correct, so Dan said moisture, add, protein, carbohydrate, and fat. So basically, and the carbohydrate is determined how? for nutrition labeling purposes, total carbohydrate. Do you remember how, yes, Michelle? Yes, so we, what we, what Michelle said is basically we analyze ash, fat, protein, moisture, and then we subtract from 100, we get percentage of all, and subtract from 100, we get the percentage of total carbohydrate. And this is simply as a reminder because there's not one method that can get you total carbohydrate in a complex system where you have starches and dietary fiber and sugars. So there is not one method that can calculate all of that accurately. And also you want to get to 100%. So fraction analysis, you want to get everything to add up to 100%. What is the difference between and one last thing, proximate, because it's approximation. All of the methods are crude methods of analysis. So they approximate the moisture content. It's never like 100% sure that this is the moisture content. And the crude protein is an approximation of the protein because most of our methods are based on either detecting nitrogen or let's say peptide bond uh, absorption, something that is not necessarily gonna give you an accurate measure of the total protein or total fat or total ash. So what is the difference between moisture content and water activity? Colin? Yes. So what basically is uh, Holland answers moisture content, total the amount of water that is not chemically bonded to a different components, whereas water activity is actually the ratio of the uh, pressure of water as water, well, actually pressure of the vapor of uh, the water from the head space over the sample to the pressure of pure water. So kind of it's the relative, I mean, yes, Michelle. That, that's the water activity is what gives you the understanding of at what water activity you have a certain reaction. So if I ask you for a definition of water activity, I'll be looking at that pressure of, of the vapor pressure of water above the sample, what it is exactly. But yes, water activity is an indication of free water available for reaction, but there are different reactions. So at different water activities, you get different reactions. So you, you don't want to say that it, what you said is the free water. You define the free water. What you, you said is the um, water available for reactions. That's definition of free water. Yeah. OK. Um, What's the importance of moisture analysis? Can you give me examples where we we want to analyze moisture? Common? Standard of identity. It's very important. Yes, Abby? Yes, determining shelf life. Chrissy? What's that? Quality control. That's very good. Yes. So there are, and sometimes you want to determine at which moisture, what, when you condense the sample, when you concentrate it and produce concentrate. So you want to determine how low do you want to go in moisture content 
to get to a concentrate sample that can preserve well and can transport well. So these are some of the importances for moisture analysis. And one that you guys did not mention is, of course, proximate analysis and transmission labeling. So we need to measure moisture, although uh, moisture content is not a part of the nutrition label or nutrition panel, it's needed for total carbohydrate. So there are a lot of methods that we measure moisture content. We haven't yet dived through them, but we provided a list, but today I'm just gonna go and start with the oven methods that are most common and continue with that. Uh, what are some consideration and errors for oven drying methods? We talked about a few of those. Do you remember? Yes, Kirti? What's that? Loss of sample. So for example, if you have, a, high moisture sample like milk might splatter if you have um that's why it's better to put it in water bath first to reduce the moisture content and then put it in an oven uh, if it's powder material you put it in a force draft oven and you didn't put glass wall it might blown away because of the air circulation so you have lots of sample others can include what sample if it's too hot and you have high carbohydrate, you have reducing sugars, you have proteins, you end up with mild reaction. You can have other chemical reactions happening. Mild reaction is a condensation, so that ends up overestimating moisture content because you lose some of the chemically bound water. Others is like oxidation. You actually gain um, weight, not necessarily water, because you're gaining oxygen, so you're increasing the the weight, the dry matter weight, so you end up underestimating uh, moisture content. Another place where you underestimate uh, moisture content is when you have hydrolysis. Hydrolysis, when you break down bonds, you can capture um, water molecule. That's like hydrolysis of sucrose, for example. You form glucose and fructose, so you get H2O back into each one of them, divided into each one of them, then you add water to that, and this is an underestimation, results in underestimation of the moisture content. There, yeah, they are, these are some of that, and we mentioned others, so make sure you know this, you review this. So I'll go ahead with the different drying oven methods, and you will be doing three different uh, drying methods in lab next week. So one of them is the forced draft oven. It's called forced draft oven because you have hot air circulated or forced into that oven and circulates. Um, it is an official method of analysis. So you have AOHE method and AACTI, and now AACTI is known as cereals and grains. Um, instead of American Association of Cereal Chemists International, it changed to cereals and grains. Okay, so you have official methods for utilizing um, force draft oven for many different foods. And the advantages of it, you have even circulation of food. So no matter where you put your sample, so you will be weighing your samples in uh, small aluminum dishes and you're going to put them in the oven. No matter where the, you put them, it's going to be even heat distribution. So that is an advantage. It's simple. You just turn it on, put it at the desired temperature, put your samples in, come back the following day. So after it's anywhere between 18 to 24 hours, which is usually the number of hours where it's enough to evaporate most of the water out or all of the water. You take the sample, put it in the desiccator to cool down, then you take the measurements. It's pretty much not time consuming other than weighing before and weighing after. Disadvantages include volatile compounds may evaporate. So other than water, if you have any volatile compounds in there, flavor compounds, any other volatiles that might just leave your sample, uh, that might add to the difference in weight. So you might overestimate moisture content. So more will evaporate. Not only water will evaporate, others will evaporate. So your dry matter will be less. That means you overestimate moisture. Chemical reactions, we just talked about a few examples. 
or it can lead to overestimation or underestimation. Make sure you know both what would lead to an overestimation, what would lead to an underestimation. Burning of carbohydrate, for example, leads to overestimation. Um, Flattering, we talked about that, and potential powders being blown away, which we can control by putting um, plastic. Vacuum oven. Also, there are vacuum oven method is another official method of analysis for many food, food products. And the advantages of it is you are drying under some vacuum. So when you dry in the vacuum, the boiling temperature of water increases or decreases? Coleman? It decreases. So we can evaporate moisture at lower temperature. Or we can evaporate moisture quicker if we put it at 100 degrees. We might get the moisture uh, moved quicker. And if we put it at 70 degrees overnight, we can also get an efficient removal of the moisture. So that benefit, why is that beneficial? Because it might not induce burning of carbohydrates, for example, in some foods, it might not induce Maillard reaction. So you might not get overestimation of water. You might still lose volatiles though. So if volatile loss can still happen, the disadvantage, another disadvantage is that they, you don't have even distribution of the So you don't have air flowing in and having an even distribution. So that is a disadvantage. There might be some precision uh, issues if you put one sample in one location and another rep in another location. It might have some the differences there. It might reduce your precision. Um, the other thing that is important about vacuum oven is you'll see that in the lab is the use of water trap. So you don't want any moisture that gets evaporated to get to your vacuum pump. You need a pump to suck out, out the air to create that vacuum. But also your water is going to evaporate and it might get to the pump and you don't want that. So we call the cold finger or we have um, a trap there. So it's basically a flask you'll see with desiccant in it. So this is desiccant. When it's dry, it's blue, it gives you an indication that it's dry. And when you see that it's saturated, its color changes pink or purple. Um, but that we put that desiccant to capture the water, preventing it from going to your pump. Another oven is your microwave oven. You are going to also have your samples dried using microwave oven. In this case, it's very fast, much faster in a few minutes, um, depending also on the sample. Some samples take a little longer time than others, uh, but it is relatively quick, a few minutes, four to eight minutes. Um, it is really good for like cheese products. So you'll see it's all the, those of you that have um, cheese samples, processed cheese, cheddar cheese, parmesan. So you will get really good results. It's often used uh, during processing or production of cheeses, kind of a quick quality check. Um, it's not really suitable for high carbohydrate. You might get burning of the carbohydrate um, there. So some of the products that say baby cereal or Cheerios might not be that great of a method for them. Um, and another thing, it's very important that the sample is uniform, packed well or placed well in this uh, sample container or holder here. Um, you'll see a video of that, um, Rachel is going to have that posted for you. Um, you will not be able to see the oven next week because it is placed next in the lab next to the pilot plant. So we're not gonna go there, but you'll watch a video and you'll get the data of your sample. Um, so back to that placement of sample, it has to be uniform, centered, and uh, given the appropriate amount of time. 
to get your reading. There are some official methods out there using microwave oven, but they're limited to some tomato products, meat, and poultry. Other quick methods of analysis. These are not necessarily official methods of analysis. You can get quick reading. If you really want to know approximately what your moisture content at the beginning of a storage study, for example, or if you want to equilibrate your sample uh, at a certain moisture content, you can quickly use uh, balances to give you an idea of where the moisture content is. So um, it, it won't be used for nutrition labeling. You cannot use these for nutrition labeling. It can be only used as a quick quality control uh, method. So this one uh, utilizes infrared drying. So the uh, radiation uh, heats the sample. So the heat from the radiation penetrates the sample, heat it, and cause moisture to evaporate. And it's really at high, you get high temperatures. So that's why you get evaporation really fast and you get reading very fast. But again, this is not accurate measurement, it gives you approximation. There is the rapid moisture analyzer. It's based on halogen heating. Again, you heat the sample up and get evaporation of water very quickly. And then you measure the difference in, in the weight of the sample and you get a reading for moisture, approximation of moisture content. This is not very commonly used anymore, but it used to be used for moisture estimation, which is distillation method. Here you place your sample with soluble and water, which are co-distilled. So you put them, you put them in a flask. You put the sample and solvent in a flask. Uh, so the water, so you put your sample in the solvent, which is soluble, and water and soluble, water from your sample and the solvent will evaporate when heated together, and then you have a distillation, where distillation by cold water. And both water and toluene are collected after they distilled, and you measure the volume of the water. And that's it with that. The another uh, method for determining moisture content that is an official method of analysis for a lot of different foods is the Carl Fisher titration method, and you will be doing that in the lab. So this method is official for uh, several low moisture foods, um, candy, chocolate, roasted coffee, um, some dried fruits and vegetables, spices. So it is really good method of analysis. Doesn't mean that you cannot use it when you have high moisture food. You will be able to get somewhat accurate measurement on your cheese sample, for example. It just takes a long, potentially a little longer time uh, to titrate. Um, it is relatively rapid. It happens within some few minutes, um, depending again on the sample size and the moisture content of your sample. But it, it doesn't have really high throughput. So you do one sample at a time, or at least the equipment we have is one sample at a time. We do have an automated titration unit, but still, you can inject one sample at a time. Um, it is accurate for low moisture food and low fat food in general, but it, again, it is relatively accurate for higher moisture and higher um, fat content. We, we say low fat content food because there is this question of if you have fully unsaturated oils, uh, they they might interact with the iodine, which is part of the reaction. So that is one concern there. But again, has been used for um, all sorts of different foods. It does not involve heat, so there is no uh, you know chemical reactions that might happen at heat at high temperature that might cause over or underestimation. So that's a good advantage um, there. So it's a volumetric titration. So basically, we titrate with a reagent. We call it Carl Fisher reagent. But that reagent has multiple components. The main component are the iodine and the sulfur dioxide. So in the presence of water, there is a chemical reaction that happens where you generate sulfuric acid. So you have um, 
the water reacts with the iodine and SO2 to, to, to have that chemical reaction happen. And when water is depleted, then the measurement is when you titrate more artificial reagent, the iodine in that reagent will give you um, a reading, or you would see that by poten potentiometric or conductometric endpoints um, due to excess iodine. So measure of the volume of titrant, titrant is used, but definitely you'll see in the lab you take measurements of your the syringe that you use because it has the amount of volume um, of the amount of water or amount of sample that you have um, in there. So you, we do have to take the amount of sample measurements and the solvent that is used is methanol. So your water is extracted with methanol. Methanol is hygroscopic. So it kind of picks up the water. So you take the weight of your sample and then it gets extracted for about 18 hours in methanol. And then you take the extract and that extract gets injected into your um, automated processor unit, which you will learn more about it and see it in action next time. Um, so you can standardize the method by determining what we call the Carl-Fisher reagent equivalent, which is how much of water reacts with one milliliter of Carl-Fisher reagent. This standardization can be done using either water or water and methanol or another uh, reagent, sodium tartrate dehydrate. So there is a manual Carl-Fisher titration uh, unit, but we fortunately have an automated Carl-Fisher volumetric titration unit, which you will be using in the lab. It's much simpler than the manual uh, one. You'll learn how to use it in the lab. Okay, I think that's it for Carl-Fisher. Okay. Uh, there are physical, physical methods for determining moisture content, and there's so many of them that they get really confusing. Um, there's this dielectric method, which is based on measuring the electrical properties of water. Um, and you need a standard curve for this one, so you would prepare a standard with different moisture content, and then you just measure the dielectric constant. And, and then you measure your sample and use that standard curve to determine the moisture content. So if it's pure water, you have a dielectric constant of 80.37. This is an old, um, older method as well, which is based on specific gravity. It is the picnometer method, which is Maybe you put it in your sample, and it's mostly for liquid samples. It's not for solid samples, so milk, for example. Um, you can use the hydrometer um, for quick measurement of uh, moisture content in milk. So it's basically you place it, and then the volume dis displaced is displaced. So basically, it says uh, a solid suspended, so that's hydrometer suspended in your liquid will be buoyed by a force equal to the weight of the liquid displaced. So that, that is, uh, this is its principle basically, but again, it's used for liquid samples. Refractometer is also used for liquid samples and it's an indirect measurement for uh, moisture content because really it's measuring uh, total soluble solids. And then you, by subtraction, you get the moisture content. So the refractive index is really a ratio of the signs of the angle, uh, the incident ray angle to the refracted ray. So the refraction is dependent on the concentration of solids. So the angle of refraction is dependent on the concentration of solids, and then you get different refractive index. Um, but you have to hold the temperature constant wavelength of the light that is the source of the incident beam 
all to be constant if we want to compare uh, concentrations. Freezing point. So this is also um, mostly used as a quick measure to determine adulteration in milk. So you have a freezing point for milk of approximately 0.5, negative 0.527. So if you have higher, if there is water added to milk, then the freezing point will be higher, obviously. So FDA reject milk with freezing point above negative 0.527. Anything above that point is an indication that there's water included in, in the milk. So for a comparison of methods, I refer you to table 15.5, chapter 15 in your, in your textbook, if you want to look at comparison of methods and what's the advantages, disadvantages. Okay, so as part of moisture analysis is determining water. So we talked about moisture content so far. So now I'm going to talk about water activity for a little bit here. And I know you've learned about it previously in food chemistry. So this is here a refresher of water activity. Um, so it affects important qualities and safety factors. So it impacts the growth of, of um, spoilage microorganisms or pathogenic microorganisms. So there are certain water activities as, at which microorganisms in general start growing and pathogenic microorganisms specifically start growing. It impacts chemical reaction, whether there are enzymatic or non-enzymatic chemical reactions. So here's a, a figure that I took from Dr. Ted Labusa, or based on uh, Dr. Labusa's publication. It is, is really nice, it looks complex, but it tells a great deal of things here. So let's let's look at this figure and try to understand what it's telling you. So down at the bottom, you see the range of water activity from zero, zero to, to one. So you have here the water activity down at the bottom. Here, you have the reaction rate. On top, it tells you the dry foods are in the range of say zero, to 0 0.3, 5, 0 0.4, somewhere here. And then intermediate moisture food gives me an example down here about what, what are the intermediate moisture food and where the water activity lies. And then the moist food right here, beverages, fresh meat, fruits, vegetables, they all have higher than 0.8 water activity. And then there is here the temperature of a uh, glass transition going from glassy state to rubbery state at which temperature you have a change from glassy to rubbery so usually here at in in this region glass the glass transition temperature is much greater than temperature here and then here you have the Trans, uh, huh, temperature of glass transition slightly greater here around equivalent and here it is temperature is greater than trans, uh, glass transition temperature. So now that these these are the components of the graph. So now not, let's look to see what what does that mean. All right. So if we look at Maillard Browning for example. So the Maillard browning increases, the Maillard or Maillard reaction rate increases between 0.4 to, it starts to increase 0.4, you see an optimum around 0.7, and then you start seeing decline as you increase the water activity. And we also see higher Maillard browning at temperatures at or above glass transition. Okay. Lipid oxidation, if we look at lipid oxidation, um, lipid oxidation is 
can be high at water activities that are low, and then it declines and then increases again. It follows a very weird uh, uh, kind of graph. And then here it shows you noticeable increase in molecular mobility above the glass condition. And below certain water activity, you, you start seeing hardening and drying of uh, certain uh, food products. So if you have a potato chips, for example, it can, with an increase in um, water activity and getting close to temperatures that are close to glass transition, we can lose crispness of the water, the potato chips. Also with increasing uh, water activity and temperature getting closer to glass transition, we start seeing powder caking. So if we're storing powders and if we have temperatures that are warm and you have relative humidity that is a little high, then you start seeing caking of these powders. So if we look at microbial growth, uh, we start seeing microbial growth here around potentially 0 0.7 to 0.8. And then after 0.85 to 0.9, we have a really good spike of microbial growth. So high moisture food, basically, with high water activity, they are very perishable, basically. So this is what, I mean, I like this graph. It tells a lot of stories here. But if you decipher it first, you need to decipher and understand what it's telling you, but it tells a really nice story. Um, here's the plot of water activity to moisture content. And also, just a reminder that when you're plotting, we'll talk about isoplane in a little bit, but when you're plotting water against water content against water activity, if you see here, it's always, it's always the relationship of uh, amount of water, amount of water per gram of solid. So that is moisture on a dry basis. Okay, so if you remember, we talked about moisture on wet basis moisture and dry basis. So this is just the ratio of water to dry matter. That's that's the figure, is a ratio of water to dry matter. Here is just giving you examples of different food products. That's your potato chips. It has a very low water activity. If, 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 if the potato bag is open or there is a crack in it, and you try to eat the potato chips, it's not going to be crispy. It's going to be a little bit um, mushy, <laughs> depending on how long the bag of chips was open or cracked. Um, if you see here, the, the grapes, they really have high percentage of water, and that translates to really high ratio of moisture to solids, water activity of 0.97, very perishable product. And then you have the products in between here. So common commonalities or things to remember about water activity. Um, when you have a water activity of 0.2 to 0.3, which is around the mono layer, you have the most stability for most foods. So that's where you have the minimal reaction rates, no microbial growth. So with higher moisture content, you start losing crispiness upon water gain. And that's when at particular temperatures, you might be getting closer to that trans, uh, the glass transition temperature. Glass transition temperatures are very much related to the moisture content. The higher the moisture content, the lower is your glass transition temperature. So you remember that. Um, so, and then it gives you different, uh, what happens at different ranges, um, you know, you, you start getting stickiness of sugary powders uh, at water activity of 0.3 to 0.4. So leave your sugar jar open, it's a humid summer day, and your sugar is going to be sticky and cakey. Um, 
So there is, for example, in the situation of raisins, so below a certain water activity, you start getting hardening, and you want to get to make sure you're around that water activity where you have the appropriate texture for that uh, raisin or marshmallows. Uh, point six and higher, so point six is the onset of microbial growth. Uh, point seven to point eight, you have maxima for chemical reaction. Point eight five, onset of bacterial pathogen growth. So you have spoilage bacteria or microbial growth, and then you have the pathogens. So there is a difference in onset there. And anything above 0.97, obviously, is very perishable, rapid microbial growth, unless it is refrigerated, frozen, pasteurized, what have you. So again, here back to the uh, question we had earlier when we asked about water activity. We're really looking at measuring the amount of moisture in, in vapor state at the equilibrium in the head space. So you have your uh, sample and you measure the vapor pressure from that sample. So we're measuring the vapor pressure in the head space above the sample and relate that to the pressure of water. And that's your water activity. So all relative humidity is a percentage and water activity is a zero to one ratio. And e ERH represents equilibrium. It's an equilibrium relative humidity or the relative humidity at equilibrium or water activity at equilibrium. So when we do measurement, we need to control different factors. The size of the container and the amount of sample that needs to be controlled, the time, the temperature, and the sensor calibration. So at different temperatures, you're gonna get different results. So we wanna make sure that we have a certain temperature and time all controlled and the, and the sensor is being calibrated and the amount of sample is controlled as well. So there are so many different ways to measure the water activity. The list is huge. And if you have Ted here lecturing, he would go on and give you samples and bring different to tools that he used. But really the main ones that are being used are the dew point measurement and the electric hydrometer sensor. So these are the two that are mostly used. So you will see decagon devices that are either based on viewpoint or uh, electro electric hygronic sensor. So this is a figure that I got from, from the textbook. So it kind of like gives you an idea of how they work. Now, I'm just gonna give you the high level idea of how they work. And then you will have uh, water activity testing measurement in the lab as well. So, you have the dew point analyzer and you have the electric uh, hydrometer. So in dew point, what's the dew point? You know what the dew point is? You've heard before. You've, what's dew? What does that word mean? When you get up in the morning and you see, huh? Yes, yes. So uh, Abby said the point. Uh, the temperature at which you start seeing water condensing, dew point. So you get up in the morning, sometimes depending on the temperature before, the day before and the temperature in the morning, you see some uh, moisture on your um, windshield, a little bit of uh, drops on the plant, water droplets on the plant. So the dew point. So what happens here is you have your, your sample, and temperature is controlled. And then once equilibrium is reached, so you have fan here to um, circulate the air, and then you have your vapor that would reach a chilled mirror. So the change in temperature is gonna cause condensation. So the point at which you got con condensation is registered. And it's used to calculate the pressure. So you calculate the pressure of your water, and then you have the pressure of the sample, and then you get um, 
you get your water activity daily. So in the electric hygrometer, you have a substance that is hygroscopic. So it either loses moisture or gains moisture based on the relative humidity of the environment. So any change in conductivity here, in, when you have electrodes, due to changes in the absorption of the hygroscopic material that you have, that would be detected. So change in conductivity in this case. Or capacitance. So, so you have electrodes and you have a hydroscopic substance and it will either pick up moisture or give up moisture depending on the relative humidity or the water activity. Okay, so these are the two main principles really for water activity. Here's the table for FYI um, that Essentially, just gives you a range of the water activity of different types of food, ranging from potato chips, hard candy, all the way to ketchup and milk and fruits. So you can see the different ranges. And on the other side, you see how you can control the water activity. So in previous years, we used to uh, plot isotherms in labs. So what we used to do is we used to get a baby cereal, one of the products, and we used to equilibrate it at different water activities for two weeks, three weeks. We just want to make sure that they, it reaches that uh, water activity. So the way to curb, not curb it, to have it reach specific water activities, put it in desiccator and we put different salts. So we put different saturated salt solutions. And each of these salt solutions we prepare will give us different water activity in the environment in that desiccator. So you can utilize these different salts if you want to equilibrate um, the water activity of the sample over storage. We do that a lot when we do storage studies. For example, one of my students was looking at a storage stability of microcapsules. So we need to control the relative humidity during storage so that we can monitor change that is not related to relative humidity or temperature, just only related to the differences in her sample makeup. So we stabilize it. So she incubates her sample at specific water activity. So let's say 0.33. So we want to use magnesium chloride uh, salt solution to do that. You can do that by desiccators and salt solution, or you can have a relative humidity chamber, which is more easy uh, to regulate. It's, it's obviously expensive to have a humidity chamber. We do have one in our lab, and we can regulate relative humidity and temperature, and we can store our sample that way and monitor anything we want during storage. Okay. So this is a table, table 15 and 6. It also tells you where, uh, what the different methods that are direct methods, indirect methods, water activity measurement, and tells you where it's used. So it's used for production, during quali for quality control, for product development or research and development, and for basic research. So it's a very good summary able to tell you where different methods are used. Moisture sorption isotherm, not my favorite, but I'll cover them a little bit here. Um, so, so moisture sorption isotherms are usually plotted to determine shelf life. So basically they are plotted uh, to look at, at equilibrium, the relationship between um, moisture content and water activity. And this relationship, when we plot that relationship, so we have our samples, and I told you in the past, we used to do that. We have our samples equilibrated at different water activities. So we plot, we determine the moisture content. So what we do is we, we determine moisture content at the initial, the beginning and then what we do is we store them at 
in those desiccated or different salt concentrations. And then we take them out and measure moisture content. So we're using pearl fisher. So we have now our water activity at a, a particular water activity, and then the moisture content at that water. And we use this data. So usually we have seven or eight data points. So storage at seven or eight different water activity, and then you measure moisture at each point, and you plot that. There are a lot of different equations that you use to plot the isotope, but you, you usually select the one that would give you the most information, information about the monolayer, information about the multilayer, that gives you <coughs> accurate uh, prediction. There's so many equations, and, um, and there are ones that are selected that would work the best, and usually it's the GAB. But, but, but that's not your concern. What I want you to know is, so these isotherms are plotted and are used to determine mostly the most important component is the monolayer. So at what moisture content and what activity you have the highest stability of the product. <laughs> so what this is showing you here is how you, the, the relationship, what is the isotherm, and how it's based on determining the moisture content at when you reach equilibrium at the set water activity. And that's what I was talking about is when you store it for a few weeks, two weeks, three weeks until you reach equilibrium. Um, it is dependent, the isotherm is definitely dependent on the affinity to the water sample. The temperature, change the temperature, you get different relationships. Um, the relative humidity, obviously, the surface area. So when we store them, the more surface area you have, the, the quicker equilibrium you can get. Okay, So it's good to store with um, having enough surface area. Here's an example of isotherm we produced in the lab in the past, where it, we use the DAV uh, calculations to plot the isotherm. And here is a sample that is baby cereal that we have uh, incubated at different water activity and measured moisture and determined the monolayer, which is the moisture content and the water activity at which you have the highest stability. Okay, so that's basically what it's uh, telling you. And this is just showing you again what we do with the incubator, and we can plot desorption and desorption. Um, basically, you can have equipment um, that can get give you the actual sorption, which is the gaining of uh, moisture and gaining or increasing relative humidity, and the desorption, which is the, the going back from high rate of humidity to low rate of humidity. There are equipment that are dynamic that basically can give you uh, the moisture absorption isotherms in a shorter period of time. You don't have to incubate your samples for two or three weeks to get an isotherm. So it's just an equipment where it equilibrates faster and measures simultaneously moisture content and relative humidity at different uh, water activities. So this is just a FOI Okay, with that, this is, this is it for moisture. And uh, we will prepare videos for you to talk about what you're going to do in the lab next week. Have a great weekend and see you Monday.